In this video, we're going to continue our look at weathering. In this video, we're going to continue our look at weathering, erosion, and deposition, paying particular attention to rivers and how they erode and deposit sediment across the earth. As always, we have a quick handout to go along with this video, which you can go and grab at the website. So let's begin by reviewing these key terms. So weathering is the breaking down and changing of rocks as a result of exposure to the environment. So when rock in nature is exposed to the air and wind and water and ice, those forces will eventually break rocks down from larger pieces into smaller pieces known as sediments. In some cases, those rocks might actually change composition as a result of these weathering interactions. Then we have erosion. Erosion is transportation. So once my sediments have been broken down by weathering, erosion is going to move them from point A to point B. So think about, to give you an example from today's lesson, uh, sediments being transported by the movement of water within a river. That's erosion. Finally, at some point, deposition is going to occur, and this is the dropping off of sediments that have already been weathered and eroded. So once they've been broken down, once they've been moved, then they get dumped somewhere, and that process is known as deposition. So again, today, we're going to focus on one particular agent of erosion, and that's rivers, or flowing water on the surface of the earth. These have a huge impact on shaping our planet, and so we're going to look at all the details about uh, what they do to the surface and how they affect the rock that they flow over. So we'll begin with a simple question, which is, what is a river? So if we had to actually define this term, it's pretty simple. It's simply water flowing downhill through a channel or some sort of defined pathway. By the way, you'll see I use the word stream and creek and brook. We can use these essentially interchangeably. Um, oftentimes, creek and brook and stream are used for smaller rivers, um, whereas the term river is used for a larger volume of water. But for all purposes, those can be synonyms. So let's look at the anatomy of a river or, or what some of the parts of rivers are. And we'll begin with this little diagram right here of a little section of a stream or a river. Um, and the first thing, and this is going to become very important, is, is when we see these curves or bends in rivers. And we have a name for that. Those are called meanders. And that's very important because at a meander, uh, we see a lot of erosion and deposition happening in specific ways which we will look at. Uh, along the edges of the stream or the river, we call those the banks. So the stream banks or the river banks. And then along the bottom, we call that the bed. So the stream bed or the river bed. So when we have a smaller stream that flows into and merges with a larger stream, we call that a tributary. Um, and all together with all of the tributaries in a main river, we have a river system. Uh, oftentimes, a river system is part of what's called a watershed. And so a watershed is an entire region of land. It may be hundreds and hundreds of miles, um, but it's an entire region of land where all of the tributaries, the streams, and the rivers, and all the groundwater in that region merge together and flow into one central water body, whether it's a river, a lake, or the ocean. So that whole area of land is called a watershed or a drainage basin. So let's talk about the speed at which a river flows, or velocity of a river. So the velocity of a river tends to depend on three main things. The first being the amount of water within the stream, and that's called discharge. So typically speaking, the more discharge, the more volume of water within a stream or river, the faster that stream or river is going to flow. Next is slope. So is this a steep stream bed or a fairly flat one? So logic tells us that a steeper slope is going to make the river flow at a faster velocity, and that's because gravity is going to pull that water downhill faster. Finally, the shape of the stream channel actually plays a pretty major impact. So if you think about um, two streams, so let's think about a narrow kind of V-shaped um, stream channel um, which is, you know, pretty steep, maybe a lot of water, but, but the channel itself is pretty um, narrow and V-shaped or, or almost even like a U-shape. Um, well, that water is going to be able to flow faster than a stream that's going to have a very wide and flat-bottomed bed. And the reason that is is because 
the more area where the water is flowing over the rocky stream bed, the slower it's going to go because of all of that surface area. So that water has to flow over all of those rocks and in and all, out of all those nooks and crannies, as opposed to if we have a V-shape, that water is going to have less friction with the ground and it's going to be able to go faster. So typically, um, a rounder, deeper, uh, a more curved or V-shaped channel, the faster the stream will flow versus a wide, flat channel. So if we look at a river channel, which often does have this kind of V shape, um, within the river itself, the fastest velocity is going to be where we see this X right here. So not along the beds where the water is kind of grinding against the ground, but up away from the beds, generally in the middle of the stream. This does change if we're going around a meander. In a stream, a straight flowing stream, we'll tend to see it where this X is. So fastest in the center, up away from the stream bed. So now let's talk about the age of a river. Um, and yes, rivers do have ages. You can tell by looking at a river whether it's a young, newly formed river or a more ancient river. Um, and so we'll start by looking at the characteristics of a young river system. And so these are going to be, um, generally speaking, kind of more intense. So they're going to be steeper. They're going to have deeper, more narrow channels with a faster flow of water. They're going to have fewer curves or meanders. And as a result of all that, they're going to go faster. And that means more sediment is going to be eroded and less will be deposited. So all the rocks and the sand and the silt and clay are going to be carried away, not being dropped off. And that's due to all of these characteristics together. So if you see a river like the one in this picture right here, you can conclude that this is a fairly newly formed river. Um, this has not been around for thousands and thousands of years. On the other hand, an older river is going to be exactly the opposite. It's going to have a gradual slope, so more flat as far as the bed goes. Shallow, wide channels, which all result in a slower flow velocity. We'll often see these big, wide, curving meanders, and the result is that we get a lot of deposition. So sediment is constantly being dropped off, and you can actually see that in this example right here with all of these sandbars within the, uh, the river flow. That's all deposited sediment because the water is constantly slowing down and dropping off whatever it's carrying. So now that we've talked a little bit about velocity, it's important to point something out, though it is pretty logical, and that is the faster a river is flowing, the bigger the sediments that it can erode or transport, which makes sense. If I have a very fast-flowing river, it's going to be capable of transporting along larger size sediments, so sand and silt and clay, but also in some cases it can even bounce along pebbles and in the fastest rivers, possibly even cobble-sized rocks. This is very logical. It's all summarized in this chart right here. So if we look at this, um, what we see along the bottom here is the velocity of the stream. So as I go from left to right, the stream is going faster. And then on the vertical axis, I see size of sediment being transported. So what I'll notice here is that let's say I have a velocity of a stream that is about one centimeter per second. So if I come up and I hit the curve here and I go over, the sediment that stream is going to be able to transport is going to be classified as sand, right? So it's going to be somewhere between 0 0.006 and 0.2 centimeters in size. So that's fairly small sediment. That's what a river going that fast is able to transport. But if I speed up to, let's say, uh, 50 centimeter per second river, so a much faster flowing river, that's going to be able to carry pebbles. And that is logical, right? Because the faster the river is flowing, the bigger the sediments it can carry. Only the fastest rivers on earth are able to carry big sediments. So if I look, um, you know, maybe at 100 or a little more than 100 centimeters per second, that kind of river is able to actually transport rocks that are six, seven, eight centimeters in diameter. So those would be classified as cobbles. So this chart shows us that the faster the stream velocity, the larger the sediments it can carry. So if we look at those sediments, this is what they would look like as they're being eroded within a river. So obviously the smaller sediments are going to be suspended. So the silt and the clay, that's going to be carried along up in the body of the water itself. And that's going to be subject to the currents and the velocity of the flow. 
Sand might be hopping or bouncing along the bottom, and then the bigger sediments, the gravel, the pebbles, and possibly cobbles, are going to slide and roll and bounce along the stream bed. So this is what it looks like, and you can see massive amounts of sediment are eroded by rivers, especially fast-flowing younger rivers. So when streams flow fast, they're going to tend to erode sediments to pick it up and carry it away. And when they flow slowly, they're going to deposit it. They're going to drop it off. So the logical question becomes, okay, well, why do streams speed up? Why do streams slow down? Because if you can identify that, then you can predict where more erosion will happen and where more deposition will happen. So if we look at our meander again, um, what we're going to know is that on the inside part of curves, water is going to be forced to slow down. And the reason that is, is because when water is traveling around a sharp curve like this on the inside part, it can't go as fast. It's a sharper turn, and physics tells us that that water is going to be forced to slow down. As opposed to on the outside of a curve, it's got this big sweeping area to go, and it's less sharp, and therefore it can go faster. I often think of this the same way I think of a race car going around a curve on a racetrack. You have a choice when you approach the curve. Do you slow down and hug the inside of the curve? You have to slow down or else you'll flip. Or do you keep your speed and go on the outside of the curve where you can keep your speed up a little bit higher? Well, it's the same in the river. On the inside of a curve, the water slows. And on the outside of the curve, the water speeds up. And so, of course, there's a consequence of that, and that is that on the inside, where it slows down, they deposit sediment that they're carrying. And you can actually see this in the picture by looking at this whole area right here. All of this sand and sediment, that was deposited there because the river slowed down. And when the river slows down, it drops off whatever it's carrying. Whereas on the outside, where it speeds up, it's going to erode additional sediment. And you can tell because all the sediment has been worn away, and you can see that with this steep river bank. So you can tell just by looking at a meander where the erosion and where the deposition has taken place. Similarly, we have another diagram here showing meanders. On this example, one of the things to point out is that depending on the direction of the meander, the shape of the channel is actually going to vary. So if I look at this, um, let's look at point A here and point B here. So a is the outside of a curve, so that's erosion, and B is the inside of the curve, so that's deposition. So where there's erosion, the rock and the sediment's being worn away, so we're going to have a steep, more jagged kind of slope. So that means that that would look something like this. So this would be point A here, and then where B is, that's where the stuff is being dropped off, so we would have a more wide, flat, uh, deposition-driven area of the river. So A and B match up like that, and we should be able to do that. If I look down here at C and D, so C is on the inside of this meander, so C is going to have the flat slope, and D is on the outside where it's going fastest and where we see erosion, so that's going to be the steeper slope. So let's look at some real-world examples here. So here's a meander in a river, and just by looking this right off the bat, we can tell where there's deposition and where there's erosion. So we should be able to label it with these terms, right? So inside of a curve is slow, outside of a curve is fast. So those words go there. Inside of a curve where it slows down, we're going to get deposition, and you can actually see the sediment deposited and the outside is going to be erosion. So you can see pretty clearly what's going on. Let's look at another example. Um, this is another great example, so I'm going to bring my terms in. So inside is slow, outside is fast. Okay. Inside is deposition, outside is erosion. And again, you can actually see it if you look at the diagram here. Um, this steep slope right here is all steep slope. That's because all of that sediment is being carried away, as opposed to this whole region right here where all this sand and sediment is, that's your deposition because the water has slowed down. So we see this all over the place, and it becomes very, very clear when we see stuff like this sediment right here. This is the inside of a curve, and that's there because the water has slowed and deposited what it was carrying. And you can see this at most rivers on Earth. It becomes very obvious what's happening. Here, this is a great example because you can actually see within the water 
that all of this sediment, you see how this water is cloudy? The sediment is on the inside of the curve because that's where the deposition is taking place. So if that erosion and deposition continues long enough, then those meanders might get so wide that it actually alters the shape of the river, and it may even cut off a portion of the river to form something called an oxbow lake. So over here, this is our oxbow lake. Okay, So that used to be part of the river, but due to in extensive erosion and deposition, that part of the river actually got cut off and the shape of the channel has changed, leaving that lake behind with this telltale kind of horseshoe shape. Um, so if you look at this, this is how that happens. The erosion and deposition continue, the meanders get wider and wider until the river actually meets itself in a location, and then deposition takes over and cuts off that meander creating an oxbow lake. So here's an example of an oxbow lake. There are actually several in this picture. Um, and here's some more. You can see them over here is an oxbow lake. Here's an oxbow lake. Here is an oxbow lake. So those were all actually part of the meanders at some point, And over time, they've been cut off. So let's finally shift our attention to focus specifically on the deposition that occurs within a river. So streams slow down not only when they're on the inside of a curve, but also when they enter a larger body of water. Like, for example, if a river or stream flows into a lake, a larger river, or, or even in some cases the ocean, that water is going to slow down. And we know from our previous conversation here that when water slows down, it can't carry as much, so it deposits it. So whenever water slows down, deposition occurs. So here we have a cross-section of a river flowing down the side of a hill, a slope, right? fast, 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 but then it hits the lake and it slows down. And because it slows down right there, it can't carry the sediment anymore. So right in here, we're going to see lots of deposition. I like to think about this the same way as I think about a water slide. So if you've ever been on a water slide, you know that as you're going down the slide, you're going faster, 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 and then all of a sudden you hit the pool at the end and your body stops, essentially. And that's because you've entered this larger body of water and the velocity slows down. And the same thing happens in a river. And when that occurs, the sediment that the river is carrying is dropped off. And so the sediment that is deposited creates this kind of weird accumulation of, of uh, sand and silt and clay. And that accumulation is called a delta. In some cases, that delta can become a new landmass. So here's an example of a delta. So all of this kind of grayish, muddy sediment has been deposited as this little stream enters this larger body of water. All of these deltas, you can actually, they're massive. You can see them from space. Um, this is the Amazon River Delta. It's huge amounts of sediment that have been deposited over time. So uh, the sediments uh, that are deposited within a delta are generally sorted out by size, with the largest ones dropped off first, and then smaller and smaller sediments as you get further and further out into the lake or the ocean. So here's a diagram that kind of shows that. Um, because when the stream enters the body of water, it slows off, it slows down, it's going to drop the bigger stuff first, and then as it slows more, smaller stuff, and then as it slows more, smaller stuff, and then eventually smaller and smaller until it has deposited everything that it's carrying. So that sediment, that sorting, is called horizontal sorting because the size of the sediments is sorted out from big to small, from side to side. Okay. Sometimes, though, we'll have sediments that deposited very quickly, and that might result not in horizontal sorting, but in vertical sorting. So uh, rapid deposition you know, for example, if I have a rock slide on a cliff where a bunch of sediment is dumped into a lake all at once, then my biggest sediment is going to accumulate on the bottom, and the smaller stuff is going to settle a little bit slower and end up being on top. And so we end up with this vertical sorting. And we have a name for vertical sorting. It's called graded bedding. So that's when we have top to bottom, small to large. Uh, and this is a, what that actually looks like. You can see on the bottom are larger size sediments. And as you go up, they're smaller. And that would give us graded bedding. So horizontal sor uh, sorting occurs when the sediment happens gradually, whereas vertical sorting happens when it occurs quickly. That's key. Now, final thing is, 
because of this abrasion, so this is a word we've used in other videos, abrasion is a type of weathering when rock kind of grinds against rocks. Now, in rivers, sand is constantly bouncing against pebbles and rock, um, and it's wearing it down. And so the rocks that have been weathered and eroded and deposited by streams and rivers tend to be generally rounded and smoothed out, something like we see in this picture right here. So if I were to just hand you one of these rocks, even though you don't necessarily know where it came from, you could interpret, you could conclude that it spent time in running water, and that's how it got the smooth, rounded shape that you see. And so that's our look at rivers for today. Uh, just to kind of sum up some of the key ideas, um, meanders, curves in rivers, uh, tell us about the age of the river, and we can identify where erosion and deposition occurs. We see sorting, whether it's horizontal or vertical, and we see rounding in these sediments. And so those are some of our key ideas for river erosion and deposition. Rivers are an incredibly powerful force that has been shaping the earth for billions of years. Um, and rivers all have a story to tell. And by looking at them and examining their characteristics and the characteristics of the sediments within them, we can actually learn a lot about their age and how they have impacted the earth in the past and how they're changing the surface in the future. They're an amazing force that really leaves its imprint on our planet. Thanks for watching.